Hi. This should be the last topic in homeostasis. Uh, today, I want to talk about how cells will communicate with one another um, generally in order to maintain homeostasis. So um, big picture approach first. Um, close to 100 trillion cells in an adult, adult body. Um, and they're all specialized in some way, meaning that a liver cell does not do the same things as a skin cell, does not do the same things as a brain cell. But all three types of cells, for instance, are required to maintain body-wide homeostasis. So if they've all got um, individual goals and then big picture goals for the whole organism, it necessitates that they communicate with one another. So how? How do they communicate with one another? So the way that they communicate with one another is primarily by what we call intercellular, inter meaning between, but intercellular chemical messengers. What do I mean? What I mean is cell A will release a chemical that cell B can detect and respond to, and that's how they communicate with one another. <clears throat> so in this figure right here, which we'll refer back to as I'm going through this lecture, we have um, three different types of chemical messengers. Here's cell A, three different cell A's, and here's cell B, three different cell B's, okay? And here is the chemical that they are using to communicate between cell A and cell B, and there are actually three different categories of chemicals, and that's what I'm going to introduce you guys today to today. So this specialization of cells necessitates that they, um, the liver cell can, for instance, tell the brain cell that there is something toxic in the bloodstream that needs to be to detoxified or that you're working on detoxifying it. The brain cell can tell the skin cell that you need to, for instance, activate sweat glands to cool down the whole body. Some examples. So <clears throat> how this is accomplished is um, the um, secretory cell, cell A, is going to release what we call a chemical messenger um, into the extracellular fluid, generally speaking. And the chemical messenger is going to travel by some mechanism or another to what we call a target cell. It's a really general term. A target cell just means that the cell actually has a receptor for the chemical messenger that you're discussing. Okay, so if you think about what target cell kind of could be, if um, testosterone is released from the testes, and if you've ever been a boy going through puberty or seen a boy going through puberty, you will know that testosterone has impacts all over the body. So I want you to brainstorm and think about the places that testosterone has impacts. So I have a 13 year old right now. He has this year shot up taller than me. So testosterone impacts bone growth. He is getting muscular. Testosterone impacts skeletal muscle. It is impacting what he thinks about, whether he tells me or not. Testosterone impacts brain function. Testosterone impacts multiple places. His voice is dropping. He hasn't started growing facial hair yet, but that will come. He used to smell delightful, and now he smells like a teenage boy. Now, not dissing boys. The same kinds of things, of course, happen with estrogen. So if you want to think of where target cells are for a chemical messenger, um, imagine a chemical messenger that you know of and think about the things that will change their physiology or their function when that one is released. And testosterone is a great example. Okay, but then what happens inside the target cell after the chemical messenger gets there is the target cell is going to do something in response to the chemical messenger. Otherwise, why bother releasing it, right? Now the something that it does is incredibly specific to the cell and the chemical messenger, but I will just give you an example. Hopefully in anatomy you learned that um, a skeletal muscle fiber has these actin and myosin contractile proteins in it. Hopefully you learned that. You don't go into a ton of detail in anatomy, but actin and myosin are the contractile proteins inside skeletal muscle primarily. And um, so what does testosterone do for skeletal muscle? Testosterone goes to skeletal muscle and causes increased protein synthesis 
of actin and myosin, so you actually get more contractile proteins inside each cell, making the muscle both bigger and stronger. Okay, what is happening inside um, that skeletal muscle cell in response to the chemical messenger binding to the target cell with a receptor? We generally will refer to that as a signal transduction pathway. It's really just the mechanism by which the target cell responds, and it's different for each target cell. So what we're going to do is we're going to cover signal transduction pathways a little later um, in the semester. Um, but just to introduce you to the concept. So the target cell has to do something, and it's not magic in the way that it does it. It is a specific pathway that's actually going to go on. So we'll come back to that. Okay, so um, I want to introduce you to the functional classes of chemical messengers. When you look at chemical messengers, before you start to categorize them by their chemistry, you categorize them by their functionality. So um, you've probably heard of at least two of them before, and three of them are shown in this picture right here. Um, I'm actually going to teach you four, one more besides what's in this picture. Okay, so um, I know that you've heard of hormones before, and I imagine, well, I know that you've heard of neurotransmitters before, okay? And then there are also paracrines or paracrine agents, which you may or may not have heard of before, but you've certainly experimented with before, so we'll talk about that. And then there's one last category that your textbook doesn't go into, but it's really closely related to paracrine agents. So how these are first categorized is really by how they travel from the secretory cell to the target cell, from cell A to cell B. How do they get there? Um, so let's introduce you to the three categories, so um, the four categories. So first off, um, hormones. So what makes something a hormone is not that it's related to sex or reproduction. That's how a lot of people know the word hormone, and there are those, and they're very important, of course. But what makes something a hormone is um, how it travels from cell A to cell B. And hormones, by definition, are going to be secreted by um, endocrine organs or endocrine cells, okay? Uh, they don't have to be glands, but quite often they are. And um, what's going to happen is it's going to get picked up by the bloodstream and it's going to travel through the bloodstream to its target cell. So hormones allow for what we call endocrine communication, which is usually longer distance um, and usually a type of extrinsic control, often to maintain negative feedback, but not always to maintain negative feedback in homeostasis. So with that in mind, do you imagine that the effect of a hormone on its target cell would be instantaneous within the matter of nanoseconds or milliseconds? No, it's probably not going to be because it's got to go through the bloodstream. We know that the blood does not flow instantaneously. So if we are talking about testosterone getting from the testes um, to the brain, right? It's going to take a little while. And by a little while, it could be a matter of minutes, um, but uh, still much longer than something that just has to travel a microscopic distance. So um, the effect of a hormone usually takes a little while to um, ramp up, okay? But then, um, since the hormone is in your bloodstream, it also takes a little while to ramp back down because you actually have to clear it out of your bloodstream before it will stop finding the target cells. And sometimes it's cleared by the target cells. Sometimes it's cleared by the liver. Sometimes it's cleared by the kidneys. But that's also not instantaneous. So the effects of a hormone can take a little while to begin, but they can last for hours or days, depending on how much you release. And the other thing about hormones that's really important is that since they go into the bloodstream, there is no limit to the number of target cells that they could interact with. They could go to the brain, skeletal muscle, bone, all that kind of stuff, or insulin, which has target cells a lot of places in the body. So it can have really widespread effects. So let's talk about some examples of hormones. Insulin, right? Sugar regulating hormone, glucagon, which I also used as an example in a previous lecture, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, thyroid hormone. There's tons of them. As we, when we get to the endocrine system, you guys will learn, I think, 32 different hormones, where they come from, where they go to, their chemistry, their targets. 
Um, okay, so one last little thing about um, your textbook. This textbook also uses the word neurohormone, but I want you to understand this really clearly. A neurohormone is simply a hormone that is released by a neuron to go into the bloodstream but it doesn't behave any differently than any other hormone once it gets into the bloodstream. So importantly, I don't want you to confuse a neurohormone with the next category, which is a neurotransmitter. So for my purposes, I always lump neurohormones with hormones, but your textbook uses the word neuro, neurohormone. So you do need to be familiar with it. Some common hormones that your textbook categorizes as neurohormones that we will learn this semester are released by the hypothalamus and they include ADH, um, which is antidiuretic hormone and also oxytocin, but there are other hormones that your textbook categorizes as neurohormones. Okay, so now let's look at the next category and sort of compare and contrast how this one works compared to the other one. So here is a neurotransmitter. A neurotransmitter ha um, has to meet two criteria in order to be that category. First off, it has to be secreted by a neuron, check, right? but it can't get dumped into the bloodstream because then it would behave as a hormone. It's secreted by a neuro neuron right next to, within microscopic dim, um, distance of um, its target cell receptor, okay? So they act very, very closely to the site of release, okay? So um, it has to basically be a microscopic distance so that it can diffuse across relatively quickly. Now, why do you care about these? Um, it is going to cause a response, and would you imagine that the response after a neurotransmitter is released is going to be quicker or slower than a hormone? What do you think? Neurotransmitter or hormone, which one is going to be quicker? The neurotransmitter is going to be way quicker, right? Because it is going to be released and then the cell is almost instantaneously going to respond to it but there are also some other things. So it's gonna be a short on, short on, really quick turn on, but then it's also going to be able to be turned off really quickly. It doesn't go into the bloodstream. There isn't even very much of it that's released. And generally speaking, there's a breakdown or removal mechanism right at that place. So neurotransmitters, you also probably learn just a tiny bit about in anatomy. They allow for what we call synaptic communication. Sometimes that's extrinsic control as well, because for instance, um, the neurotransmitter that is um, going to be released to cause my little finger to um, bend. Um, the neuron cell body is all the way up here in the cervical region of my spinal cord, but the neurotransmitter is released right down here. So that's a relatively long distance communication. So it can still be extrinsic communication, but it's fast extrinsic communication because the action potential goes down here up to 250 miles an hour, and this does not go that um, d that uh, speed. Okay, so neurotransmitters also by definition do not go into the bloodstream. If they did, they would be categorized as a hormone slash neurohormone. And um, they primarily are going to communicate with a smaller category of cells. They communicate, neurons communicate with other neurons via your neurotransmitters. They also communicate with all three types of muscle tissue, cardiac smooth and skeletal, and then they also communicate with glands. And their effects are going to be targeted, not widespread, because I didn't dump them into the bloodstream. I actually only released them right at the site that I wanted to communicate. Okay, so examples of neurotransmitters, and we're gonna learn some of those this semester as well. Uh, dopamine, serotonin, those are two of your happy neurotransmitters. They allow you to feel chill and manage your business. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter we know most about because um, it is actually released between neurons and skeletal muscle cells and it's easy to experiment on comparatively. Um, but we're gonna learn a lot more neurotransmitters this semester. I love neurotransmitters, it's my favorite part of physiology. And then last but not least, I'm going to introduce you guys to paracrine agents. Um, actually, and their friends, the autocrine agents. So what is a paracrine agent?
So these are the ones that you're probably less familiar with than the other two, at least I was when I took physiology. So with a paracrine agent, it's basically neighbors communicating with neighbors. So if I have two cells that are in the same tissue or the same organ, and they communicate with one another, right? then they are going to release um, a paracrine agent, a chemical ma uh, messenger to communicate with their neighbor. And this is often necessary to let your neighbors know what's going on. Like if you've been injured or have an infection, you don't need to tell the whole body, at least not initially, you need to tell your neighbors what's going on. So for instance, a skin cell communicating with another skin cell would use a paracrine agent. A liver cell communicating with another liver cell would use a paracrine agent. Um, and they act on their neighbors. So this is generally local communication. It's intrinsic, okay, intrinsic control generally. And you need relatively low concentrations. They just go out here into the extracellular fluid, like, just like this one did. And specifically, by the way, it's um, interstitial fluid when it's just between cells within a tissue. So they just diffuse straight from one cell to the other. You don't need very high concentration because it's the neighbor, right? Um, and almost every tissue in your body has the capacity to release a paracrine agent. Now, Something that I'm gonna talk about in this next little video right after this is sometimes if paracrine agents are released repeatedly because this one is infected and it's like still infected and still damaged and still infected and can, keeps releasing paracrine agents, sometimes they'll release so much that they'll just eventually get picked up by the bloodstream. But that's plan B, not plan A, okay? so. Um, what I want to do is I'm going to stop this video here and then I'm going to go into a longer explanation of paracrine agents in the next one.